Well, good morning, my friends, members of the Howard County Association of Realtors. I'm Sarah Anderson, your current 2022 president, and I'm so excited to have you join us for this coffee chat this morning and bring you this wonderful resource of information, Dr. Jessica Louts from the National Association of Realtors. So you've probably heard us talk a little bit about this before, or maybe you've chatted with your colleagues about it, but the real estate market from 2019 and really through right now is somewhat of a unicorn sort of market. Deals came fast and easy, whether that's good or bad. And now we're shifting into a market space where we're going to have to change the strategies we've been using over the last couple of years. And that's why we decided to have the wonderful Dr. Louts come on and talk with us this morning. Dr. Louts, we're so honored to have you here with us through Zoom. And if you already are not familiar with Dr. Louts, she presently serves as the Vice President of Demographics and Behavioral Insights at NAR. And she's going to help us understand how people are behaving in the current market with all this talk of recession, rising interest rates, comparative record high rents, and so much more. So as we go through this presentation, please remember to put your questions in the chat. HCAR staff and I will be relaying them to Dr. Louts. We certainly appreciate your input and we're so happy to bring you this information this morning. And so without further ado, I'm very happy to turn it over to Dr. Jessica Louts, who's gonna help us understand how buyers and sellers are reacting to the current market conditions. So Thank Dr. Louts. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, Sarah. I'm super excited to be here and to share with you the latest and greatest. I did see um, a Q&A in, in the chat box. Um, I promise you I've switched up my slides from yesterday. So if you tuned into the forecast summit, uh, I'm going to take a little bit different take here um, and talk about some other research. If you did not tune into the forecast summit, um, it was myself and Dr. Lawrence, you and our chief economist here at NAR, and we were going pretty in depth for about an hour um, into what... Uh, uh, the environment is facing right now, the housing market. Um, and Lawrence actually went uh, so in depth that he covered commercial and international as well. And the recording will be posted uh, hopefully by the end of today, if not tomorrow. So definitely check that out and you can grab our slides there too, if you missed that one. Um, but let's jump in and talk about some of the consumer behavior that we're seeing right now. Um, it is a very unusual market. As Sarah uh, said, this is, uh, we're transitioning. We are in a moment of transition. So if you're new into the real estate industry, this is going to be completely new for you. Um, if you are a veteran in the real estate industry for a long period of time, uh, this is going to be, we're headed back. We already are back to more of a 2019 pace, which was actually a really fast market as well. Uh, but I want to jump in and show you what folks are talking about. Um, if you caught the daily this morning, if you caught any piece of news this morning, I think this is on everyone's mind, is inflation, uh, paying more at the grocery store, paying more at the pump. Luckily, those, those gas prices are starting to trend downwards at least, um, but paying more for a lot of goods that we hadn't in the past. Uh, the Daily from New York Times has a, a podcast every morning and I listened to it and someone was saying in uh, middle America, they were paying $5 for an avocado. That's a lot of money for an avocado. Um, luckily, we're not paying that here in this region, at least not at my grocery store. But when you look at inflation, it is the highest that we've seen in four decades. It's hitting you as you drive around potential buyers uh, to homes, as you show them homes. Um, that is certainly an impact to you and your gas pump. It's also an impact to consumers. If they pay more for rent, it's going to be harder to save for a down payment. We know that that's happening. And we know that that is definitely a hit to con consumers out there, especially first-time home buyers. Um, when we look at this, we know that the Fed is continuing to raise the Fed, raise the Fed funds rate, and as a result, uh, mortgage interest rates for the 30-year fixed are also rising. Um, we know that they track kind of close together, but not necessarily. Uh, the spread right now is larger than uh, what our chief economist would uh, typically see, and he went into depth yesterday on why that is and, and what's happening there. Uh, so definitely do check out that forecast summit listing. The end result, though, for your consumers, for your home buyers out there, if they're looking as perhaps a first time home buyer at a $300,000 home, that's a jump in payment of $500 a month for a mortgage payment. That means a completely different area or a different type of home or a compromise somewhere along the way that they wouldn't have had to make if they had found a home in January. Now, that being said, inventory was so tight in January. It was actually the tightest that we've recorded back to 1999. So not necessarily going to find that home. So 
if consumers are still in the market um, and still working with you, they do have that jump on payment. They're probably making some compromises along the way, unless they've locked in uh, a lower interest rate that they have with that mortgage lock with that mortgage broker. Um, if we're talking about a $400,000 home, that's the national average. That's probably more in line uh, with your market as well, though perhaps a little on the lower side. Uh, right now, what we do see is that would be an $800 jump. And that that's quite substantial. I think either one of those could honestly be a car payment or daycare. Uh, it definitely could hit into someone's monthly expenses. When we look at a national scale, and honestly, locally as well, what we do see is that there has been this rush in the market. Uh, homes are moving very fast uh, still because we do have this low housing inventory. Uh, so while there's more inventory coming into the market, when we're talking about an all-time low, you're essentially, if we made the comparison, we were talking about weather before this essentially started, um, you're talking about, sure, 108 degrees is really hot. And if it drops to 103, sure, that's cooler, but do you actually feel that? I'm not entirely sure. Uh, in the DC region, obviously it was very hot this last weekend, not 108, thankfully. Uh, but I don't know that you would feel that that drop in temperature, especially for home buyers out there when they do feel this pressure. Uh, we have three months of inventory right now in the marketplace. But that being said, it's not actually because that includes pending contracts as well. So if a buyer falls in love with a home online and it's under pending, you know they're not going to be able to get that. The other thing that we are seeing, and this is continual, is we do have a double digit rise in prices. So our original forecast at the beginning of the year was actually that home prices would moderate with these rise in rates. Uh, that forecast was revised yesterday upwards for prices. So we're not seeing uh, that prices are, are necessarily going down, they're quite sticky. And I think some of that is because of the home buyers who are in the marketplace. I'm gonna show you some of that data as well. I think it's important to note that there's a lot of well-off people who have saved money over the last couple of years who have housing equity and they're actually able to pay these higher prices and higher rates. They're willing to do it. Uh, and a lot of them are actually coming into the marketplace and paying all cash as well. So these rise in rates don't necessarily impact them. And people really want to get in. They want that, that equity uh, gain that they could have um, through home ownership and not necessarily, you're not going to have that through renting. So when we look at the selling market today, this is from our Realtors Confidence Index. I went in depth yesterday on this report, but I think it's really important to kind of note some of these figures. It's really interesting when we look at this as a historical scale, but I'm just giving you the quick talking points from what we saw last month. Um, 14 days on market is actually what we saw. It was the fastest days on market that we actually have recorded in this particular data set. Um, it really does indicate that there's a lot of people who were very uh, uh, persistent and they wanted to lock in that ratified contract to really get that uh, done, especially perhaps as there are these rate locks and as buyers have moved to the sidelines. Homes are moving in less than a month and more than half are still selling for more than less price. I think this is really important when we think about the TikTok videos and the reels. I'm seeing a lot of them. I love Instagram. I love scrolling through and seeing the beautiful photos and videos. Uh, that being said, there's a lot of misinformation out there. And so cutting through that, I think is incredibly important. I think it used to be that HGTV and the idea that you could see three homes, buy over the weekend, renovate, move in the next weekend, you're all good to go. And that was complete nonsense. We know that. But I think that the reels and the TikTok videos and the misinformation is now what you all are up against. At least I'm seeing so much of it that I can't imagine that this is not something that clients are bringing to you. And there's a lot of misinformation out there. So really talking to them about this is very, very helpful. When we look at the buying market today, we still see a quarter of the market is paying all cash. We still see investors and vacation home buyers, and these are mom and pop investors are coming into the market. So perhaps Airbnb being their property, but also taking a vacation there themselves, does it's a crossover into an investor as well? It's not a strict definition, um, are, are essentially buying a non-primary residence. And 30% of the market, nearly a third, is still waiving the inspection and the appraisal. So it's talking about a fast moving market. Um, where people are still placing very competitive offers, perhaps not as much as perhaps two months ago, uh, but still a pretty competitive market. So this is where I really want you to have a takeaway here. Um, so 
when we talk about the housing paradigm that we're in right now, there's a lot of comparisons that's being drawn up to 2008, the bottom falling, all of these like really scary headlines. And I just want to underscore a few points here of what makes this different. When we think about lending today, it is completely different than what we saw in 2008. It is much tighter lending. It is very difficult to actually obtain uh, a loan today without a high credit score, without money in reserves, without a solid down payment, and a good solid income. And that is very different than what we saw during that boom period. So if I think back of the boom, I lived in the DC area. I worked at a nonprofit, um, a real nonprofit. We're very shoestring staff. I made very, 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 very little money. And I was qualified for a loan that was like $850,000 with a balloon payment at the end. Um, there is nothing like that out there right now. Thank goodness. Uh, because I, I had no business taking on that type of loan and I didn't. Uh, I took on a loan that was about a quarter of that. So when we talk about the housing market today, it is a very, very different lending market. Cats were literally being qualified for mortgages at that time period. Um, we also know that we have very low housing inventory. We've been underbuilding for more than a decade now. And we see housing starts had been coming up to the market last year. But unfortunately, what has happened is there's so many issues building these actual homes when it comes to supplies and labor that there's lots of delays. And so families cannot move into these homes if the homes are not actually completed. So they're not actually coming into the market. We're still short by four and a half to six and a half million homes in the U.S., um, we also know that household formation is happening. And I'm going to show you a chart that really dives into this and why this is a problem and how demographics are playing a role here as well. But a lot of it has to do with millennials. They're aging into peak household formation time. And that's one of the hindrances to when we think about low housing inventory and underbuilding. People are staying in their homes longer. People are living longer. They're feeling healthy later in life. And so they're staying in their primary residence. They're not going into a retirement community or something along those lines. And that's a crunch to inventory as well. On the good side, I would say absolutely. But it is a crunch to housing inventory and what we do need uh, out there right now. So when we look at all of this, what we do see is that we know that because there is this rise in prices and this rise in interest rate, it is going to bring home sales back down to a 2019 pace. It's already there. Um, it is the expectation for this year. Uh, obviously, the last two years have been a varied frenzied activity with nearly six offers on a nationwide scale for every home that's listed. So truly, this is a very different market. We're still seeing three offers. Uh, that's still a lot of strong activity. Activity, but it is a different market than what we had seen in the past. So this is where I jump into my favorite topic, millennials. I think it's important to take a look at this. This is the population chart that I was talking about that I think really speaks to the inventory crisis. So let me walk you through this. When we look at the U.S. population overall, what we see in the green bar on the far left here are the little pandemic babies born in the last year. When we look at the gray, this is where it tapers off. And we can see it tapering off because there's not a lot of people who live past 90, past 100 years old, though that's a great birthday party when we go. Smack dab in the middle of this chart here is the blue. The blue is represented by millennials. And you can see just visually very quickly that this spans the greatest number of years from young 20s all the way up to 41 years old, 42 years old now. And smack dab in the middle of that is the red bar. The red bar is the median age of a first time home buyer today. It's 33 years old. Just past that, what we can see is that those who age between about 26 to 32 years old is the biggest population in the U.S. right now. This is incredibly important when we talk about housing inventory and the lack of inventory that we have because we know it's going to be impacting the market for a long period of time. And this is not a problem that's going to go away overnight if we don't build more homes and more affordable properties for the U.S. population. The next thing that I just want to show you here is when I talk about people staying in homes longer, it's not just staying in homes longer. It's also buying homes in a different part of their life. So this green bar right here is the median age of a repeat buyer. Back in the 1980s, it was 36 years old. Today, it's 56 years old. That is a very big difference, and it has some really big implications. And people are staying at homes for longer periods of time. This 56-year-old buyer is planning on living in their home for 15, 20 years. So aging in place, uh, really thinking of this home as their own for the rest of their life at 76 years old. Um, and when we look at that, 
it has some implications because we know that the, the change that had been seen every six to seven years is now off the table. The blue is the median age of a first-time home buyer, and it is really boring. It's really flat. It's 33 right now. So when we talk about that inventory crisis, really is a problem. The next thing I want to talk about, and I touched on this yesterday, um, if you uh, did join that, I'm sorry for the repeat in a couple of slides here, but I just want to underscore this, is that I think there's an opportunity right now. There's a lot of home buyers who were pushed to the sidelines who were not able to purchase in the last couple of years because they perhaps had an FHA, a USDA, a VA loan, and they had a competitive offer, but they had those loan types. And half of members have worked with a client who had one of those loans who were just rejected because they weren't an all cash buyer because they weren't conventional financing. And unfortunately, those offers or the ones that, that were not accepted in a lot of cases. So when we look at those buyers today, they may actually be able to make that monthly payment, but they may not have that down payment together. So they may want to take advantage of these low down payment options, especially a VA loan as a veteran. Absolutely, they should take advantage of this or first time home buyer and FHA loan. This may be the opportunity to talk to them and actually revisit that conversation that now that there is less competition in the marketplace, this could be the time to get your offer accepted. When we look at home buyers today and consumers who are not in the housing market, what we do see is that 35% of consumers think that they need 16 to 20% down for a down payment and 10% think they need more than 20% down for a down payment. Y'all know that that's not true and that's not what consumers typically put down for their down payment. When we do look at this data, what we do see is that the typical down payment for a first-time home buyer is just six to seven percent in the last few years. When we look at the typical down payment for repeat buyers, it was 17 percent. So it's never really tipped up into that scale even for repeat buyers who may have that housing equity. They may want that money in reserves. They may want to remodel that home, what have you. And so they're not necessarily putting all of that down. The other thing I want to talk about here is that there are some demographic changes that are happening right now. And I want to go through three of them because I think it becomes really important to the housing market and what we're seeing right now, but also moving forward. So the first one that I want to talk about is multi-generational buying. <coughs> We are seeing the 11% of the market today is purchasing a multi-generational home. It had been as high as 15% of the market at the very beginning of the pandemic. The number one reason for that at the beginning of the pandemic was for aging parents to come into the home. So maybe it's for caregiving for that aging parent, keeping them safe from the pandemic. We knew that older adults were more at risk, but also caregiving the other way, because we also know that a lot of schools went online, daycares were closed. And so that became a really good support system. If we had more minority buyers coming into this market, and right now what we know is that the black and white homeownership gap is as wide as when the Fair Housing Act started back in 1968. If we had any closure in that, or if we had a rise in Hispanic buyers or in Asian American buyers, what we would see is there's more multi-generational buying. And why do I say that? Because about a quarter of minority home buyers are purchasing multi-generational homes. The other shift that we are seeing here is there is about a hundred year low in birth rates in this country. It went up slightly in the last year for women in their thirties, but we do know that there is a baby bust overall in the U.S. And when we look at this, it does have some implications for home buyers as well. So this particular chart, what I'm showing you is a true reflection of that activity. So what we do see is that back in 1985, 58% of home buyers had a child under the age of 18, and today it's just 31%. So a really dramatic drop when we think about that drop over uh, less than 40 years. What is the implication here? So there's three of them that I can think of, and I'm sure there's others. One, it's going to change the neighborhood that that home buyer is looking in. So it's going to change whether that home buyer needs to be close to that perfect school or not. And perhaps this opens up opportunities for home buyers who are cash strapped and can't afford to be in that perfect neighborhood. The other opportunity and the other change that this opens up is the home size. So suddenly a smaller square footprint absolutely works for families who have no intention of having children or a household who has no intention of having a child in their household, that's going to change that, that need for a larger home as well. The other change that I do see here 
is that it's going to change the number of moves that someone has. So if a buyer has a growing family, they're going to need to move to accommodate the extra children in the household. And if they're suddenly an empty nester, maybe they can move out of that perfect school district. So that's that's perhaps on the negative side, the number of moves that someone would be having, but it is absolutely a change that we do see in the marketplace right now. The other thing that we do see is that for first-time home buyers, especially, we see a drop in married couples. And this is also a reflection of what we are seeing outside of just home buyer activity. If we look at the U.S. overall and we just look at the pure population in the U.S., what we do see is that back in the 1960s, 70% of American adults were married. Today, just half of American adults are married. So that's a very dramatic drop. When we look at first-time home buyers, we can see this reflected as well, because back in the 1980s, 75% of home buyers were married and today is just half. There is a growth in single women. I think this is an amazing story and one absolutely to tell because we do see that single women are going against the odds. They are saving money. They are making financial sacrifices. They are doing so on a lower household income than their male counterparts. And they are 20% of first-time home buyers today. So that's pretty incredible to see them making those financial sacrifices and entering into this market. It was very difficult for first-time home buyers on a dual income, let alone a single income. We also do see a rise in unmarried couples purchasing homes together. So perhaps they'll get married in the future. Perhaps they won't. But regardless, they're purchasing a home together. We also see, and this is a shift, especially for older home buyers, not necessarily for first-time home buyers, is a shift towards buying as a roommate. So we do see that perhaps the golden girls phenomenon is being embraced by home buyers later in life because of companionship, because of affordability, regardless. Whatever the reason, this is something that's positive for older adults who are embracing this as a theme. So how in the world does the agent rule fit in here? So we covered so much ground. Uh, we looked at the economy. We looked at changing demographics. Um, I want to talk about how the agent fits in here, and it's very positive. When we look at this data, what we see is that 87% of buyers used an agent in their transaction. Um, when we look at younger buyers today, what we do see that millennial generation, 43% of buyers are millennials. They're using agents at higher rates than any other buyer out there. They absolutely want your guidance. They want your help. They are a growing share of the market. It's one to watch, and they absolutely want your help finding that right home, but negotiating the terms as well. We also see for sellers that 90% of sellers are using an agent in their transaction. We ask a follow-up question here and we ask, what type of agent do you want? Someone who just lists on the MLS versus someone who does your full range of services. There's all kinds of different business models out there. What we do see is that the majority of sellers did want an agent who does a full service, uh, broad spectrum of services. So someone who is with them before that home is ever listed, tell me how to fix up my home for sale price that home competitively, find that qualified buyer, and all the way past that closing table, uh, find me the contractors for my new home that I've just purchased. This is the type of seller's agent that folks want. Um, we do see that 7% of sellers sold Bisbo for sale by owner. It's the lowest historic share that we have actually ever recorded and I buyers, it's actually at a statistical zero. Um, people don't necessarily sell their home and then go on to buy a new home using an I buyer service. So that's not something that uh, we did see in the data this year, at least. So that is all I have for prepared slides, um, but I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of those insights. And um... I think the, the last note that you just left us on that I buyers are at a statistical zero, that I, I think probably gave everybody a little bit of a warm fuzzy, right? Because notoriously in our industry, when technology comes in and disrupts, we have a tendency to panic. And so to hear that the role of the agent is really as strong as it ever was is, is very comforting. I think in this market. So thank you so much for that. I'm, I'm looking at the chat and seeing if we have any questions. So guys, again, feel free to put your questions in the chat. Um, you mentioned that the multi-generational housing market was at 15% and it shifted a little bit to 11% and that most of the people looking for multi-generational housing are, are kind of in, classified as minorities presently. 
Um, do you see anything possibly changing there um, across a wider spectrum? Are more people going to be looking for multi-generational housing as our concept of housing changes? Or do you think that's gonna kind of stay flat or decrease? Like, what do you, what are you guys see in? So my expectation, as soon as we started collecting that data point, is that it has to be increasing. And the reason why is I think there's a lot of people who want to age in place. There's a lot of people who want to stay in a family setting. And there's a lot of families who want their older adult with them today, as opposed to in a nursing home or assisted living. And I think it's just changing the concept of being old and being healthy later in life as well. Um, we also know that family has changed during the pandemic. The number one reason to move last year was actually to be closer to friends and family. It wasn't a job change. It wasn't getting married or divorced or having a child. It was literally to be closer to friends and family. And so if we think of that as a driving force in the housing market, having a family member in your home is just a natural progression to me, I would think. Um, so I would think that's a, absolutely a trend to watch and want to keep an eye on. What you just said about, you know, the nursing home and avoiding the nursing home and some other conversations we've been having about senior housing and what that looks like, the number of seniors that have decided they just don't want to go into a nursing home no matter what because of some of the things that we saw during the pandemic has increased. So what you're saying about that trend increasing, even just because of that factor, that makes complete sense. Um, I'm seeing a question in the chat, so let me get that and read it to you. This is from Anna and she says, I have been getting a lot of the Hispanic community trying to buy a home, but unfortunately the majority of them have tax IDs. Every lender that I talked to mentioned that they no longer help tax ID buyers as before. Will this change sometime soon? Uh, that is reports? definitely out of um, my expertise area. Um, that is unfortunate. And I, I don't have any advice or, or really any information on that. I'm sorry, um, Anna, that that is happening to your clients. Anna, we, we can get you in touch with some lenders, I think, that can answer that question better for you and may have some options. Um, so if you want to make a note to reach out to us after this, um, that would be great. Or if you put your information in the chat, we can reach out to you too. Uh, Malika says, this is great information. Um, you're welcome, Anna. Um, I, I will ask another question if that's okay. And um, tell me if we're keeping you too, too long. <laughs> um, you mentioned like TikTok and Instagram is kind of the new misinformation media outlet, right? Do you have any suggestions on ways that agents can kind of cut through that information and reach their clients to let them know that home ownership is still a wonderful value proposition? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's so important right now to, to have the facts prepared. So when you are having clients come to you and they have this misinformation, they're saying, well, prices are going to drop. Well, no, that's not actually what our forecast says because we are short in inventory, because we do have population growth, because people are trying to find a home and they can't. Um, then I think this is where your facts really come in handy so that you can feel confident having these conversations. Also be present on social media. Um, one of the points that I, I wanted to drive home yesterday and I think is really important is that 12% of consumers are still purchasing their home physically sight unseen. They're using you in that process. They're using realtors in that process, but they're not physically walking into that home. So making sure that your virtual tours, that your listing information is as mobile as possible, but making yourself readily available to walk through that home and maybe FaceTime it or whatever you need to do to work with that client is really helpful. Some of that has to do with migration trends. People are moving farther distances away, so they can't actually physically get there. So it has to do with the pace of the market. If you are seeing that home go list and you have a important meetings and you can't get out to that house, you're going to rely on your agent to really walk you through. I know that puts a lot of pressure and it's really nerve wracking. I've talked to agents one-on-one -on -one about this process, um, but that could be really helpful as well. Just making sure your tech is up to date. That's a great point. Um, having the best technology to be able to do the best job for your clients is super important in this market when it, when it really is still competitive too. Um, so Vicki has a question and Vicki wants to know if you can speak to us about buying and selling in resort areas or second homes. Um, you mentioned that was a pretty large segment of the market. So do you have any insight there? 
Yeah, so we are seeing um, that folks who are buying non-primary residences, so whether it's an investment property or vacation home, um, that it's 16% of the market in June of this year. Uh, the height of the pandemic, we saw the highest share that we've recorded, it was at 22%. Now it's not an incredibly long data set series, um, but I think it is helpful to note that during the midst of the pandemic, people had a lot of money to spend, whether that was stimulus funds, whether that was because they weren't taking European vacations and they said, wait a second, I wanna go and buy a lake home where I can, infu where I can enjoy that year round drive to it. That's an easy property to have. Um, easier perhaps than jumping on a flight to Europe when everything was locked down at least, um, everything in perspective. But I think what we are seeing now is perhaps reverting back to a norm there. That being said, for investors out there, they're seeing rents go up and they're saying, maybe this is a good time to jump in and buy a rental property. So, you know, it's kind of a mixed bag, but perhaps less vacation property purchases at this moment in comparison to the height. Do you think we'll see some of the vacation home properties or, or investment properties increase as people like compare and contrast investments in real estate versus the oppor opportunity that might be in the stock market right now? Yeah, absolutely. I think investors are always going to be some present in the market. So diversifying your assets, certainly, you know, people find that opportunity, whether it's an investment property, um, they, they may want to have that. And I also think that technology has made this easier for people as well. So Airbnb, VRBO, great resources for consumers, but good for investors as well as they jump in and they say, well, I could vacation at this maybe a week or two, a year, but also I could Airbnb it for other time periods. And that could be an opportunity for income for me. Okay. I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, if it's okay, I, I'll ask you one more. Um, you mentioned the baby bust that, mm -hmm. that we're seeing and you talked about you know, neighborhood changes and maybe people will be looking for smaller home sizes and the number of moves that they have in their lifetime might decrease. Are there other features that those, um, you know, dual income couples or, or just onesie twosie homeowners might be looking for in their next home that, um, that, yes. that, that you've identified? Yes, absolutely. So this is a much lighter note. So please, uh, hopefully no, no one will leave the zoom on this one. Um, pets, honestly, it's a big driver. We've done reports on this. It's, I know that it seems silly, but it's, it's based in data. We see it. We see people, especially for young millennials, for single women, the driver of being close to a dog park, walking communities where their pet is going to be happy is a driver over schools. And I know that's a controversial statement, um, but as an owner of four cats, I can absolutely say having wide windows where they can look out of every day, it makes my life easier and I love them. So, you know, we, we make these sacrifices for pets, but there's a lot of money in it, especially during the pandemic when we had a pet shortage of people just clearing out the shelters, adopting as many as they could for companionship. That, that makes me, um, that, that's practical data, realistically, <laughs> because I can't, I, I'm trying to remember the names of the builders, but in two of the newer models we've seen over the last few years, they have included built-in pet stations, pet washing yeah. stations, pet feeding stations, things like that. So, and, and, and um, uh, Angel is echoing that in the chat. She says her clients are looking out for their pets too. Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, I have four cats and if I had a litter like area for, for litter boxes, it would be a game changer, but I have an 80 year old place, so I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I don't have any other questions. I'll, I'll ask our members who are on. Um, if you have any more questions right now, we're gonna ask you to pop them in the chat so that we can address them. Um, we certainly appreciate you making the time to be here with us, Dr. Louts, and this was really great information and data, and we're happy to share it with our members, and we really thank you for your time. Thank you.